And uh, it is amazing presence of the Lord. Thank you so much for inviting him in and making him king of your life. And Joe, what a testimony that is. That's amazing. That's amazing. Amen. Uh, yes, I'm a local journalist. Some of you uh, may know me from that. Some of you may not. Uh, but either way, my heart um, is Jesus. It beats for Jesus. Uh, yes, amen. I got saved 11 years ago. And um, I'm so thankful for my husband. It sounds like Joe's very thankful for his wife. I don't know the role she played. Um, but on our second date, my husband said, you're either going to follow Jesus and believe that he has a plan for your life, or I'm not really that interested in dating you. And I was like, who is this guy? This guy is like no one I've ever dated before. So before I met him, I was a rebel without a cause. Um, I still consider myself a rebel, but I know my cause now. I know my cause, right? I know why I'm fighting. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. If you have it, open it with me. If you don't, it's okay, because I can read. Um, so we're, we're talking tonight about Saul's conversion. And uh, i got to be honest with you, I was a little nervous to um, preach this message, so to speak, because um, I did not go to seminary like Pastor did and, and many of you have. And so I always get nervous because I'm like, you know, I don't really know the historical context and I don't know all the events surrounding his life. Um, but it really honestly is so simple. It's such a simple story. It's very black and white. So um, let me read a little bit of it to you right now. I'm going to start in verse 1, Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath as he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, that's Jesus, he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As Saul was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So let me get this straight. Saul is traveling to kill and, and lock up Christians, men and women Christians, followers of the way, followers of Jesus. And, and God appears to him, blinds him, he falls to the ground, and then ultimately ends up submitting to Jesus. And I just want you to know that some of you might have showed up tonight and you're thinking, why am I here? How did I get here? Maybe it was your coworker like Joe's who just kept on um, pestering you to be here. But I want you to know that Saul, who would go on to write 13 books of the New Testament, had no interest in Jesus. He was just going on his daily business, walking on the road to Damascus, when Jesus was actively pursuing him. And I want you to know that he is actively pursuing you, and it's not by accident that you're here tonight. You know, you might think, I don't really have any need. I don't really have any interest. And quite frankly, that was my story. Before I came to Jesus... I didn't know how lost I was. What I've learned is you're either lost or you're found. I don't know that there are levels of lostness. But either way, I wasn't in need of anything. I, I had a degree, a new college degree, and I was out working. I was making a living. I was paying my bills. And I'm thinking, I don't need anything. I have friends. What's the problem? And you know, sometimes God can appear in the strangest of places. Just in your day to day, he just shows up. And you're thinking, I'm not looking, but he is actively looking for you. And you know what? Eternity is in the balance. And so we can just want to do our own thing and we can be on our own path, but, but we're all wandering, right? I, I mean, I was very much wondering. I was lost and wondering and I, I didn't know it, but I wasn't living on purpose or for a purpose. I was just living. And you know, some of you might feel like everything's fine. I'm, I'm getting okay, you know, day to day. But God wants you to know that he sent you here in this night, at this time, in this place, so that he could have an encounter with you. Because whether you're looking for him or not, he's looking for you. And the best thing about this is when he appeared to Saul, and Saul falls to the ground, one true encounter with the Lord, one true encounter, and immediate submission, immediate obedience. 
And you know, he gave him a divine assignment that day. He put him on a divine mission. There's no more wandering. There's no more life without purpose. There's no more just punching your eight hours and going home. There's no more just taking care of kids all day and really wondering why in the world you're here. No, God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He wants you to go be a light shiner wherever you are, in your workplace, in your family. And, you know, some of you uh, can, can look at your family heritage perhaps and wonder about your legacy and wonder about your name. You know, um, those always DNA data test things. I thought about buying one for Father's Day because they were on sale, and I like a good sale. But I was like, man, I, that, it would be really interesting to learn my, my family history, you know, to really dive in. That it was kind of scary for me, honestly. I'm thinking, I don't know that I want to know everything about my crazy family, who I love dearly. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you come to this passage and you wonder what Paul's history looks like. And now, you know, you type in his name into DNA or Google and you see that he went on to write 13 books of the Bible. This was a man who was persecuting Christians, who was killing them, um, and, and, and happy to do it, and was revered for doing it. And God intersected his life when he wasn't expecting it, when he wasn't looking for anything. And that one true encounter would send him on a trajectory that he could have never dreamed of. And you know what? The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor can mind imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. You know, Paul went on to write that because Saul became Paul. Because once you are transformed by the love and by the grace and by the redemption of Jesus Christ, you might as well change your name because the old has passed. Behold, all things are new. Amen. Verse 7, now it says, The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice also, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, saying, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He was praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests uh, to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, it's interesting because we don't know what would have happened without Ananias' obedience. But we, we meet Ananias. We know that he loves Jesus. We know that he is a servant and, and submissive and obedient but, but he says, you know, go over and pray and lay hands on this man, Saul. And he's thinking, uh, hello, he kills Christians and it's okay with everybody that he does that. He's been authorized to do so. And, you know, it's just interesting because Ananias, even though he's nervous, even though he's scared and, you know, uh, coming out of prison, I can tell you uh, just from experience of the daughter of an inmate, some people might be scared of you. Some people might question you. I can remember wanting friends to stay the night with me when I was little and um, people being like, eh, I don't know about that. Your dad, eh, I don't know. You know, and, and I get it, right? Like guilty by association sometimes. But I want you to know that, that it required Ananias' obedience. It required Ananias' obedience. And even though he was scared, he was willing to step out and do what God had called him to do. And you might be looking at a situation and you're like, that person is scary. That situation is scary. Taking that job is scary. Staying in this relationship seems scary right now. But, but God is saying, no, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac. And I call you to do crazy things that don't make logical sense. You know, sometimes when God is telling you to do something, you're like, that's scary. And he's saying, no, Ananias, go do it. Go do it. And, and it's his obedience that, that is the prayer of faith whenever those blind eyes are open and the scales fall off. And, you know, you never know what's on the other side of your obedience. You know, sometimes you can 
think that your obedience is just for you. And make no mistake, it is for you. But on the other side of your obedience, generations would come to Christ. We're still reading about Ananias' obedience. And, you know, I don't know what God is calling you to do, but I can tell you that even if it looks scary or sounds scary or perhaps you're up against a difficult situation, if God is calling you to do it, you go lay hands on that person. You go minister to that person. You go walk with them in their shoes. You go over to their house on Straight Street, and you see what God does because it's not just about you. Generations depend on it. And I love pastors. Uh, John's prayer will go over that, over Macy. Is it Macy? Caitlin, yeah, I love that prayer because he said, you know what, to delay the second coming. You know, that, that's right, because I believe that there's a generation still coming up who's going to love God, who's going to serve God, who's still going to be obedient because there are still lost people in this world. And God's heart is to reconcile them, to reconcile them unto him. So whatever he's calling you to do, I want you to obey. Uh, several years ago, I was sitting at my desk at work. And um, I know exactly when it was because it was my first day back from maternity leave with my first child. So I'm sitting there, bebopping along, just doing my work, and my cell phone rings, and it's a phone number from Oklahoma. And I look at the screen, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I don't have that number saved, but it's from Muskogee, Oklahoma. It's got to be a good person. So I answered it because I don't always do that. You know, you never know who's calling. So I'm like, hello? And she said, is this Sarah? And I said, yes. And she said, um, this is the Division of Family Services down in Oklahoma, and we have your niece. And I was like, oh, okay, did something happen? And they said, yeah, she got sent into foster care late last night. She's here at the group home. And if someone doesn't come get her, she'll just become, you know, permanent property, if you will, of the state in this group home. And I was like, oh, my goodness, because I love my niece, but I just hadn't talked to her in a really long time. And I had a newborn, and that's scary. Um, because I wasn't sleeping, she wasn't sleeping, my newborn that is, and um, I'm like, what in the world? Like, so here we go, this is it, because that's what you do. When, when God calls you to do something, even if it's on the phone and it's one of your family members saying, come get me, that's what you do. And so uh, I look at my husband, and um, he's a funny guy, and he sits right across the way, and I was like, hey, are you ready for a teenager? And uh, he starts laughing, because he doesn't know I'm serious. And he said, uh, God is given us 13 years for that, Sarah. We, we don't know what we're doing with a six-week-old. Um, I mean, when I say she cried, y'all, she cried 24-7 our first. It was awful. And um, I said, no, I'm, I'm actually not kidding. Like, we are about to have a newborn and a teenager. And um, you got you to gotta pack your bags. We're leaving. And so he grabs his briefcase. We hit the road to Oklahoma, uh, arrive at the group home. She walks out to our car with just one bag of belongings, and off we go, back to Springfield. I'm like, this is insane. I have a newborn and a teenager. I didn't, like, I didn't even plan to become a mother, you know? Now I'm glad I did, but it wasn't in my plan. So we're driving back, and um, I'm just processing, like, oh, my goodness. And I'm a believer by this point. And I'm like, you know what? The only thing that matters is that she meet Jesus. If she could just meet Jesus, everything would be fine. There's no more wandering once you've encountered Jesus. They're, they're, you're not lost anymore because you know that no matter what you do, vocationally, no matter what you do in your family, your purpose is to shine the light of Jesus, to love others to Jesus, to talk about Jesus to everybody because he revolutionizes your life. And so I'm thinking, okay, we just have to introduce her to Jesus. How hard can it be? So um, I have no clue how long she's going to be with us. Uh, we, we don't have any kind of timetable. So here she is, and uh, we're pouring into her. We're taking her to church every single time the doors are open. We are anointing her room with oil when she's away. I'm just praying Jesus over her life. And, you know, she seems to enjoy church. She, it's not like a fuss to get her to go. She's always willing. And, um, you know, she, she never walked the aisle, though. And I want her to walk the aisle. I'm like, walk the aisle. Like, I get that walking the aisle doesn't save you, but it will empower you. And could you put some feet to your faith? Like, come on. If you can't stand for him in these four walls, you're never going to stand for him out there. So I'm getting fired up, and she's still not walking the aisle. And um, 
but she's doing okay. She's fairly obedient. She left her hair straightener on all the time. And I'm like, you're going to burn my house down. But otherwise, she was okay. So anyway, we go back to um, Oklahoma one time for before the judge. We had another hearing. Her grades are good, by the way. And that's important when you have a foster care kid in your home. Amen, right? So uh, she... Uh, the judge looks at me, and uh, we're, she's got a report card and all the stuff, you know. And um, the judge looks at me and beats his little gavel thing, and he said, she's going back with your brother. And I, and I love my brother, but he's not a Jesus shiner, you know. He's not a light shiner. And I'm thinking, all she needs is Jesus. Jesus doesn't live at my brother's house right now, you know. Like, he has not invited him in. Like, are you, and her, her mom is dead, by the way, so that's why she was with us. But I'm just like... What do you, what is, what's the problem, sir? Like, she's going to church every week. Her grades are good. Like, I don't understand the problem. Like, she's doing very, very well with us. And the judge was like, no, we, we always try for reunification with a biological parent. And I'm like, I get it. I get it, right? He's my brother. I love him. But he doesn't know Jesus. And, and as it turns out, the judge doesn't care necessarily that he doesn't know Jesus. And um, I uh, just could not get over it because ultimately... Like, my theology tells me that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God is the ultimate judge. So I go into the bathroom, and I'm like, God, what in the world? Are you for her? You tell me that you are for her. She can't even drive. She's going to be out of church, no way to get there, no godly influence in her life. I don't understand what you're doing. I don't get it, and I'm angry, and I'm mad. So we drive back to Oklahoma, and there's only one kid in the car now. And that kid is screaming and crying her head off. And there was no, you know, no one to, to just pour into, like, everything that I had learned in my short life of faith, you know. The transformation that I so want for her. And she goes off to college. And several years later, um, she goes off to college. And she calls me, and um, it's, it's almost semester. She calls me two weeks before semester. And um, she was getting ready to drop out. And I'm like, don't drop out of college. Like, you're almost done. Like, come on, finish your finals. You're going to waste all this money that you've invested into an education without anything to show for it. Now you're just going to have debt. Like, don't do that. And she was like, I'm flunking out. I'm partying every night. I'm drinking, smoking. Like, I can't, I can't maintain this. I, you know, it's just killing me. I'm going to flunk. And I'm just like, please, 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 just take your finals. Like, you have nothing to lose just taking your finals. You'll see what happens. Maybe you get a D. Like, that's still passing in college, you know. So she agrees to stay those, na those last two weeks. She calls me one week later after that encounter. And she said, hey, um, I met a girl today named Kim. And I was like, great. And she was like, yeah, she was in one of my classes. And I was like, cool. So? And she said, she wanted to know if I wanted to go to lunch. And I said, you should always take a free lunch. Did you go? She said, yeah. She said, we went to Chipotle. I'm like, great. So what happened? Because, like, she was, like, taking forever to get to the point. When you're a journalist, you don't bury the lead. Like, you start with the good news, right? You start with the big news right here. So um, I was like, Chloe, where are you going with this? And she said, well, she just looked at me over lunch, and she said, what would happen if you gave your life to Jesus? And she said, all I could think was my aunts in Springfield told me all about him, and that's what I want to do. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Woo! Yes. So Kim, this girl named Kim, I can promise you, I don't know Kim. I've never seen Kim, but I know Kim's story. She doesn't look like Chloe. They don't run in the same crowds. They don't hang out with the same um, people. They don't have the same hobbies. They don't have the same piercings or tattoos. I can assure you of that. And, um, you know, I was just thinking, like, you know, Ananias could have been like, Saul doesn't look like me. We don't hang out with the same people. He's a little scary. Um, he kills Christians. And, you know, Kim could have said that of my niece. And she could have been too scared to go share the love of Jesus over a burrito. 
But can I tell you tonight, church, that, that God is for you and not against you. You might be here and, and you just got out of prison yesterday or, or you might have just gotten off the last high, the last drug. You might still um, be high right now sitting in the service. But I want you to know that you're not here by accident. I want you to know that God will blind you with a light on the road to Damascus when you were on your way to persecute Christians. Because he's for you. And you know what? When I felt like I had lost my voice, I had lost my influence with my niece, I'm so thankful that there are people like you, like Pastor John, like this girl Kim, who says, you know what? They don't look like me. They don't act like me anymore. They don't have the same lifestyle as I do anymore. But I believe that God is for them. And he has a plan for them. And they're lost and they're wondering whether they know it or not. And God wants to send them on a divine mission that only they can fulfill. Because for every single one of you, there is a divine call. There's a divine mission. And your mission is different than mine. And mine is different than Pastor John's. And Pastor John's is different than Joe's. But we've all been called. We've all been called to be light shiners for Jesus. Amen. I'm going to end on the last three verses of that passage. It says this. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. I love that. Brother Saul. Two verses earlier, he's like, this guy's going to kill me. And now he's like, hey, brother. You know, because honestly, like, like he said, the, the church is a family. It's a family. You know, I, I can remember sitting in church when um, my husband and I first started dating and I would just sit in the very back row and cry and sob and cry the whole service. And then I'd get up and, like, run out and hope not to see anyone. And now, honestly, my best friend Denise up here sitting on the first row, it's like, it's funny. You start going to church and, and you, you plug into the body and you start meeting people. And, you know, even to hear Joe's testimony, like, I never found a church where I fit in. I always kind of felt like the black sheep. And that was kind of me. Like, I wasn't rough around the edges, I didn't think. But I didn't think like, the, like they thought because I, I'm a skeptic by nature and I, and I ask questions and I don't just take anything that someone says. But you start reading this and you start saying, you know what, though? Jesus Christ died for the church. He came for, he's coming for the church. Like there's something about the church. You plug into the church. You plug into the church. You find like-minded people in the church. And all of a sudden it becomes your family and, and people that you never thought you'd have anything in common with. Jesus is enough. Jesus is all you need in common. So he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Stay, Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. You know, there's something about staying with the believers in Damascus for a few days. There's something about staying in the presence of God. There's something about staying in, in a church planted in the house of God with other believers. I can, I can promise you that this was a very inconvenient conversion. All of a sudden, Saul doesn't fit in with his old friends because he's no longer killing Christians. And he doesn't quite fit in with his new friends because they're thinking this guy was killing Christians. So he's like stuck in the middle. But, you know, he just kept staying with believers for a few days. He just kept fellowshipping. He just kept turning up every single time the doors were open at City Reach. And then all of a sudden, he had this understanding. God has a plan for my life. He has a trajectory for my life. I don't have to be a wanderer. I'm not lost. I, I, I'm here for a reason. There's a purpose for me. And, and there's something that, that will grow that, that will make that come out when you stay with believers for a few days. When you saturate yourself in the presence and that no matter what, come hell or high water, when, when church is happening, you go there. Not because going to church saves you. Not because walking the aisle saves you. But it strengthens you. And you love what, the, what God loves. And God says, I love the church. I will build the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, there's, there's a, a, a protection that comes from being planted in a church. 
There's a covering that, that I can't explain. Maybe some theologian could. But I, I can tell you this. When I go to church, and anything I'm super concerned about in my life, and honestly, being a reporter, seeing all the awful stuff happening in the news all the time, watching the events of Israel unfold and thinking, surely this is all wrapping up any moment now. But when I go to the church, I'm like, you know what? There's something about being planted in the house of God. And my prayer for you tonight is that maybe you're a first timer or maybe you've just kind of been hit and miss. My prayer is that you would get planted in the house of the Lord. Because when you're around like-minded people and you hang out with believers for a few days, all of a sudden Saul becomes Paul. And he, he has a whole new purpose in life. And that will happen for you too. Um, the worship team can come on up. You know, one last story for you. A um, few years back, a friend of mine had asked me to do a triathlon. I love swimming, biking, running. I love all that. She had asked me if I would do a long race with her. And I'm like, man, that's quite a commitment. Like, I don't know if this is the season of my life to develop that much time, you know. And um, so I really prayed about it, thought about it, asked my husband. And was like, hey, if I do this early in the morning before um, you guys even get out of bed, what do you think? And he's like, yeah, go for it. Um, you know, just do it early and get your training done. I was like, okay. So um, it's almost race day, and I'm um, getting ready to leave my children for the first time. I had babysitting lined up the whole nine, and my husband and I were going to go out of state. And um, this girl at my work says to me, hey, um, are you still doing that race tomorrow? And I said, yeah. She said, I wouldn't go. I said, why would you not go? And she said, well, um, I was reading my tarot cards and you're not gonna come home alive. And I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I was like, okay, um, well, I know that there is power in that, but there's much more power in Jesus Christ. And I would not have entered into said race had I not gotten the go ahead through prayer, you know? So anyway, I just kind of shut her up nicely and head out the next day. But um, as I'm sitting out on this race that I was very well trained for, that I was convinced that God called me and allowed me to do it in this season of my life, all of a sudden, my strong suit, which is swimming, I grew up the daughter of a swim coach. And um, I just felt like I was drowning. Like I, I was supposed to be going a mile and a half swim. I'm like 400 yards in, and I'm quite literally anaerobic in the water, like hyperventilating in the water, feeling like I could literally die. And all of a sudden, the only thing playing in my mind was the words of the enemy spoken the day before. You're not going to come back from this race, Sarah. I don't think you should go because you're probably not going to survive it. And this girl was serious about her tarot cards. And I was terrified. And I'm sitting here in the water going, God, what is happening? I can't breathe. I had a wetsuit on. I'm like trying to like pry it away from my neck so the water can like rush in. And uh, I, I, I was just so scared in the moment because I'm looking at the shore and it's as far away as it is to just go ahead and complete the course. But to get back, it's like the same distance as it is to just finish. And I'm like, do I finish God? Do I go back? I might as well finish because going back is just as long because I was so far out already. And um, I can see my husband on the shore and he has no clue that I'm getting ready to go under. And I'm praying in my head, fully aware that God is in control of the wind and the waves. But it was on Lake Erie, and those waves were massive. There had been a storm the night before. And he said, you know what, Sarah? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I quite literally flipped over and started doing the backstroke, which is frowned upon in Iron Man, by the way. But I'm doing the backstroke because I know no other way to fix my eyes on Jesus did you quite literally look to the heavens and say, God, you've got to get me out of here alive. And you know, some of you came in here tonight and the enemy is in your ear. And he's saying, this isn't for you. You Look what you've done. Look what you haven't done. You failed as a parent. You failed as a coworker. Look at you. You're awful. You've done this or you haven't done that. And I just want you to know that, that the enemy does have some power. Sometimes it will throw your game and you might feel like the wind and the waves are crashing down around you and you're never going to finish this race alive. But I'm here to tell you that if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of your faith, that he who started a good work in you will see it through to completion. Amen. You know what? He's calling you tonight 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'll just pray with me tonight, I want to see if anyone in this room wants to fix their eyes on Jesus tonight. If there's anyone in this room who feels like you're in a race and you're drowning and you don't know how in the world you're going to get to the other side, or perhaps you're being called to a big step of obedience and you're scared to death and God's saying, no, go over and do it. You know, generations depend on your obedience. Generations depend on your salvation. You can be leading your family in a completely different direction, just like Joe, just like that testimony we heard. If you're in this place tonight and that's you, you say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to fix my eyes on him. I believe that he has a plan for my life. If you've never trusted him as your personal savior, if you've never invited him in, would you just raise your hand high so we can see it? We want to pray with you. Thank you for your hand. Thank you for your hand. Anyone else say, I want to follow him. I know that he's for me and not against me. Thank you. I just want to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, you see every single hand raised. You see them, Lord Jesus. You want to meet with them tonight, oh God. You are drawing them to you, Lord Jesus. God, thank you for your work. Oh God, praise you, Jesus. If you would just, from your seat there, repeat after me. Say, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior. God, I invite you in to be Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if there's anyone in here who wants to rededicate your life, perhaps you feel like you invited him in one time, but you've been far from him. If that's you, would you raise your hand? We want to pray with you also. I see one, two, anyone, three. Heavenly Father, you see every hand raised, God. People who say, you know what, one time, one time I was following you, but for whatever reason, I feel like I took a left-hand turn, God. These people, you see them, Lord. God, you are for them and not against them, God. Lord Jesus, I just pray, oh God, that you would solidify in their heart tonight, oh God, that they are sons and daughters of the Most High King, God, and Lord Jesus, that you are actively pursuing them, Lord Jesus, just like you pursued Saul. God, I just pray that you would give them a new name, burden them, oh God, in urgency to share the gospel and to live the gospel, Lord Jesus. God, you transform, God. Oh Jesus, thank you for your mighty work. If, would everyone just stand? The worship team is going to lead us. And if you raise your hand, just like I said in the message, you know what? I want you to be bold and I want you to put feet to your faith because everyone in this room, all they're going to do is cheer you on and it will empower you to say, you know what? I'm identifying with Jesus Christ. It says in Romans 10 chapter 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Pastor Dave wants to pray with you. Would you just come on down? Church, cheer him on as we worship. you raise your hand today that you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, you want to give your life to Jesus, come down, walk down here and walk over here with Pastor Dave. Come forward. You raised your hand. We want to pray with you. We want to talk with you. Follow Pastor Dave right here. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, Jesus. God is good. 